You know, I gotta confess, I'm actually not a fan of dolls. I mean, this one's cute and all, but listen to what happens when you press her belly. Ring around the rosy. <laughs> oh, that's creepy, right? It's night number four of the 11 nights of Halloween. And tonight's story deals with someone that makes dolls just like this one. I do hope you'll enjoy. I think every girl has had a doll of some sort at one time or another growing up. These could be small dolls with hair you can brush, soft dolls that you can cuddle with, or even larger dolls that you can put makeup on and have tea parties with. Dolls have definitely changed a lot over the years. They've become cheaper and easier to break. Worst of all is just how easily they're discarded. They wouldn't be hard to fix if someone just took a bit of time and patience with them. Now for me, Growing up in the 1950s, dolls were something very special to every little girl that owned one. The heads, hands, and feet were usually porcelain and painted by hand. The more expensive the doll, the more intricate their appearance. Some even had eyes made of glass. The clothing was usually stitched and sewn by hand, and you could purchase everything from dresses and shoes to handbags and hairbrushes for them. A really special doll was even numbered. Growing up with four brothers and only one sister, you can just imagine how hard it was for my sister to keep her doll safe from us. She would carry her everywhere she went, from the breakfast table to the bus, to school, to Sunday car rides. She even had a special pillow that she laid the doll on when she went to sleep at night. My sister loved her doll. One day, during some adolescent roughhousing with my brothers, her doll ended up falling onto the hardwood floor of the kitchen completely shattering the face. The sadness and agony in my sister's eyes was enough for me to devote myself to doll making, a profession that has all but vanished, but very much the only thing that I have ever been passionate about. For every doll I ever fixed, I always envisioned my sister's face, and imagined that the smile I saw on these kids' faces as I handed them back their doll, good as new, was my sister's smile. By the 1980s, after over 10 years in the doll making business, I was starting to see a shift away from the classical dolls that we had growing up, to a more mass-produced and disposable type of doll. I had taken all of my inheritance and sank it into something that was quickly becoming outdated. I saw less and less dolls coming into my shop. I lowered my prices, bought new machines that could repair broken plastic, and even a 3D printer for parts that I needed to replace entirely. When that didn't work, I began working for free. That's right. Free doll repair to anyone. Just bring me a broken doll, and I'll fix it. But that wasn't working either. I thought about my age and how, perhaps without the daily practice of repair, I may lose my skill. Perhaps it might even kill me. Without my shop, I wouldn't have a purpose. So, today I took a long walk in the cool autumn air, and I wrestled with these thoughts for an entire afternoon. My bones were aching at this point, and I was starting to feel drowsy. I turned a corner, and there it was, just propped up against a building in a tattered dress, with a broken leg, a missing shoe, and a scuffed face. Someone must have left her there by accident. I could fix her and put her back there good as new, I thought. I'd leave a business card on her, and... I'd be a hero to someone again. I carried her back to my shop, cleared off a table and began to inspect the workload. I have just enough material to make a new dress for her. I can repaint the face easily and make her even more pretty. I'll hand sew her some slippers to replace the shoes, and she'll be almost good to go. I just need to fix the broken leg. I can carve a new one on the lathe in about 30 minutes. I just need to cut off the old one first. The sedatives should start kicking in soon. I'll cut quickly. You're gonna be so beautiful. 